Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English, and we turn now to Shakespeare's classic King Lear, his 1605 offering, and let's go ahead and say it out loud. This will be the play that breaks our heart. Of all the titles that we study in 303, few maybe are as disturbing as this play. And it's fascinating to always ask this question. A number of years ago, I took um, uh, my planning hour and I offered a Shakespeare class to interested students. The administration didn't think anybody would show up and we had over 30 students who signed up for this class. The understanding was that all we would do is talk Shakespeare for the hour. There wouldn't be any exams, there wouldn't be any papers that had to be written, that kind of thing. So in other words, this literally was just experiencing Shakespeare and it was a wonderful experience. We had a blast doing it and one of the things that I, I realized that was so compelling <clears throat> was that when you read with a group of students over a year a lot of Shakespeare plays, they naturally start to want to inventory the ones that for them move them the most, the ones that they had the most difficulty you know, getting into, least accessible. And it was amazing to me in that year how King Lear was in almost every one of those students' minds the play they kept coming back to after they, after they had studied a good number of the plays. Some scholars have pointed out <clears throat> that if you want to understand the young man, you read Hamlet, study Hamlet. If you want to understand the middle-aged man and the challenges of the middle-aged man, you mess with Macbeth. If you want to understand the challenges of aging and growing old, the geriatric challenge, then you study Lear. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll get into this and debate it a bit at the end of our conversation. Let's make sure that we understand a few assumptions as we always like to point out. The first is that you've been following our stuff on LearnStrong.net in the AP folder. If you haven't looked at our introductions to Shakespeare and studied with us a few of the other texts, I'm not going to say a lot about Shakespeare's biography. I mentioned 1605. Think of it, Hamlet is 1600 performed on stage, we believe. So five years later here, we've got, uh, we've got this amazing offering. There's been a lot of debate about Hamlet being the play that was most compelling in the 19th century. But by the 20th century, and uh, some scholars have pointed out, it has a lot to do maybe with the war, the genocide, the killing, and all the terrible catastrophes of the 20th century, that all of a sudden Lear became the play, the go-to play to study. Our assumption is as well that you've paid attention to our learning theory, that desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, useful ways. We hope that we can do that here. Also, we are assuming that you understand our three levels of reading, as we call, as we call it, the level one, what does the text say? Summary, level two, what does the text mean? At 2A themes, messages, at 2B, the rhetorical reading. And here we'll be paying attention, as we've been doing in all of our discussions of Shakespeare's plays, to primarily two things, symbolism, we're going to see a, a lot of that. For example, just pay attention, write it down in your notes now. Vision, eyes are going to be really important in the same way that they were really important when we came to our study of Sophocles' um, Oedipus and Oedipus Rex, Oedipus the King, and the idea of, of uh, vision and perspicacity, right? Uh, also, we'll be concentrating on irony. And this, this play has a dark end to it. Shakespeare didn't invent the story of Lear, but he certainly changed much of the ending to make it far more tragic than it need be. Um, Cordelia uh, will, will, in the end, be dead. And to that degree, we'll think about uh, Sophocles' Antigone. We'll be making those kinds of observations there. And the irony as well of the opening lines and the use of the word nothing, nothing comes of nothing, and the minute we say nothing, we're already jumping to uh, level three. Well, at level three, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way at 3A, other texts we've studied? Certainly, we're going to find that by Lear, Shakespeare's already beginning to assume so much of what he's already done in this great text. There is going to be, for example, I mentioned the word nothing. Well, of course, we know about Shakespeare's uh, Macbeth and that famous Act 5 soliloquy, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. It is a tale, Macbeth will say about life, told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. And here we're going to hear that nothing comes of nothing at the opening of the play and then we're going to be back to nothing at the end of the play. Of course, we'll also think about something like the comedy Much Ado About Nothing, which is going to play a similar kind of epistemological game with a much darker ending here, obviously. 
Finally, in 3B, we'll ask, how can I relate to this information in some personal, meaningful way? Hey, guys, I don't want you to just enjoy Shakespeare because I'm telling you that Shakespeare is a great writer and you should enjoy him. No, 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 no. That's silliness. What I want you to do is I want you to adopt a position regarding Shakespeare founded in an actual study reading of his plays. And I hope Lear will, even though it's a darkly tragic play, it will lead you to have some recognition for the genius of the playwright himself. There are a lot of performances. Netflix has just released recently in the last year a performance by Anthony Hopkins that plays, he plays Lear. And I certainly recommend it to you to watch as many performances, uh, Laurence Olivier's classic, as he plays Lear as well. There's so many uh, performances of Lear that uh, I think are important for you to have watched. It helps to watch those performances if you've done a bit of a study. Now, our other assumption is that you're familiar with our big five as we are referring to it in these lectures. That is to say, we're always asking about at least five philosophic, tangential kinds of concerns. Epistemology, what does this text say about what we can know? Ontology, what does this text say about who we are? Psychology, what does this poem tell us about the individual psyche or mind? Sociology, what does this play tell us about group, group behavior? It's a fascinating study in that regards, no question. And then finally, theodicy, the question of why is there evil in a universe created by a, a divine uh, power or divinities? Um, and while Lear is not going to be set in a Christian world, it's actually in a pre-Christian world, <clears throat> there's no question that the theodicic question is front and center especially as, it, as we come to the end of the play. Is it going to be the case, for example, that one of the great villains of all time, along with Othello's Iago, we will have in this play Edmund, and his, his basically destroying the world of so many people. We're going to ask about that one, and, and, and does, in the end, do we have some sense of harm, harmonious justice in the world? Final assumption is that you're reading on your own this text, studying on your own, maybe viewing on your own, and then coming to our comments uh, as, as help. Okay. Now we're going to work through a summary, then we'll, uh, then we'll address these just as we've done before. Think of it this way. As we have said many times in 303 in our study, if we are in fact the stories that we tell, the stories that we retell, the stories that we accept, and importantly, the stories we reject, then what is it that King Lear tells us about ourselves and about our world? I, I think this is a play that still has some resonances, as we will see. Let's do a quick summary. We are in an ancient time, as I said, a pre-Christian time. We are in England, and Lear is a great and mighty king. The most majestic of all of Shakespeare's kings at the beginning of the play, and that will be significant for the downfall. When we see Lear later in the play, for example, lost and maddened, he's gone crazy in the woods in the middle of a storm, talking to a chair, pretending as if it's one of his mean daughters. We're going to recognize the downfall, as Aristotle talked about it in Poetics. Go back and take a look at our lectures on, on Aristotle's Poetics, so central. But we will begin with Lear. However, he has decided, he's grown old enough, that it's time for him to divide his kingdom up. He's got three daughters, he's going to do it that way. Um, and... Because he, you know, he doesn't want to have civil war between his daughters, he's decided he is going to make this kind of a division before he dies and not after he dies. There's all kinds of irony at the beginning of the play. By the way, we should point out, Lear doesn't have a son. All he has is three daughters, and, they, and, and, and we're going to get into those daughters. His daughters... He will divide by, interestingly, not, a, 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 not directly a lottery, but kind of a lottery, and then he's going to ask each of his three daughters to tell him how much each of the daughters loves him. Right? I mean, kind of an insane project for a father. Hey, uh, Regan, hey, Goneril, hey, Cordelia, and tell me that you love me. Tell me how much you love me, and to the degree that you can flatter me and tell me this, I'm going to reward you with Scooby Snacks, namely I'm going to divide up my kingdom. Now it seems to be clear from the very beginning that Lear is going to save his best for last, namely Cordelia. It's going to be first Goneril, then Regan, who will say how much they love their father. And it's clear that all of this is just a pseudo genuflection. It's all made up. It's all gross. And yet Lear buys it all the way. Then he comes to Cordelia clearly his favorite. He has saved the best for last in terms of the land that he wants to give. And Cordelia, and this is an interesting moment, we got to debate it at some point. Why doesn't Cordelia just play the game and go along? She doesn't. She doesn't. 
very much like Antigone. She is a strong woman, and she cannot believe that her father has put her in this circumstance. And her word then is, I have nothing to say, nothing. To which Lear will respond, nothing comes from nothing, and it will be at this point then that Lear loses it. Now, we have seen fathers losing it on their daughters. Go back to our comments on Romeo and Juliet and Lord Capulet messing up the life of Juliet. You will marry Paris or I'll throw you out into the streets. We have a very interesting similar moment where Lear goes from this fairly kind of, you know, calm, regal kind of king to literally looking infantile as he begins to demand that Cordelia tell him how much she loves him. Cordelia can't do it. Um, and in the process, she, uh, she's going to be punished by, by her father. Um, first of all, um, he will disown Cordelia immediately. He's very rash, right? Very foolish, very rash old man. He refuses to give Cordelia any kind of a dowry for a marriage. And in the end, the king of France is the only one that will accept her. And so she will go with the king of France off. And it's the king of France who can see Cordelia for what she is. Remember that we have said before, Shakespeare, epistemologically, is always pointing out to us the distinction between appearance and reality. We go back to our study of Plato's Republic, go back and take a look at our comments on LearnStrong.net in the AP folder. And here we're going to see something very, very similar. Lear just does not understand what it is that he's doing. He's going to then give the kingdom to nasty Goneril and Regan, um, and Goneril is going to be married to the Duke of Albany and, uh, and uh, Regan married to the Duke of Cornwall and between the two of them we've got the two nastiest villains. I mean, Shakespeare has serious issues with women in his plays as we have talked about many, many times but you're going to find no two women more disgusting, grotesque, vile than these two, uh, these two women. And, and then he will say it that he is going to spend the rest of his life then moving between the two daughters' kingdoms, and more particularly their castles. Uh, of course, this may have been what his plan was all along. I don't want to have to take care of myself. I just simply want somebody to take care of me. And we're going to see that, boy, oh boy, do they take care of him. Now, we've got another character at the beginning of the play, Ken. And this is really a, a supporter of Lear, and he symbolizes in many ways complete fidelity, complete loyalty, and Kent, and Kent tries to tell Lear that this is a stupid, stupid decision that you're making. And Lear gets mad at Kent and will banish him as well. Um, and in the meantime, Kent will then take on the persona of a second person. Namely, he will be a helper to the king. And throughout the play, he will in fact be there to assist the king. The king unaware that in fact it's Kent. We have a second plot in this play. And, and, and put this in your notes. This is hypercritical. This is the one play of the tragedies that we have that has a complete second plot line which will repeat, or some scholars like to use the term, mirror the action. And so now we move to another stupid old man, a foolish old man, um, and uh, what is it T.S. Eliot says in East Coker, uh, let me not hear of the wisdom of, of old men, but rather of their folly. Clearly, <laughs> Eliot was thinking about a play like this. We have Gloucester. Now, Gloucester is an interesting guy. Uh, at the very beginning of the play, he is actually talking outright about Edmund, um, a, a young man who is his son, but is rather a bastard son. Okay? And he speaks in really disgusting and, deter and disturbing ways about Edmund. And in this moment, we see the birth of a really nasty villain in Edmund. Now, unlike Iago in Othello, we don't know why Iago is really that disturbingly upset at o Othello and wants to take him down. We clearly have a sense of it here in this play. Edmund is a bastard. He has a brother named Edgar, and he wants to make sure that he gets all of the Scooby snacks that are coming his way, and in the process, he's going to take down his father as well as his brother. Um, and so we've got this scheming that starts to happen, all right? He does uh, use a scheming mechanism to trap uh, Edgar, his, his brother, who's kind of gullible and silly, um, and in the process is, is, you know, really a nice guy and, and is going to be taken down into making it look like Edgar is wanting to kill Gloister. And Gloister is, you know, he's so stupid that he doesn't check. And because of that, um, he's going to go after Edgar. Edgar's got to run for his life. And in the play, following what we said about Kent uh, um, kind of um, you know, disguising himself, we're going to have 
poor Tom, a homeless uh, bedlam beggar who's kind of in the, in the woods as if he's, you know, gone crazy, if you will. Now we're back to Lear. Lear has, ostensibly he's retired, he has his, his retinue of troops with him that basically he just sits and parties with, and he shows up at Goneril's house and her husband Albany, and he brings his fool along with him. And this is one of the geniuses of this play. I wish that I could do a line-by-line -line reading of this play for you guys, I just don't have the time. But go and look at the lines of the fool, and the fool will tell Lear what it is that he's doing. The fool will say out loud, and this fool character is an important one of those things in Shakespeare's plays. We've seen it a number of times, and I said to you before, sometimes um, Shakespeare will give his best lines to his fools, his idiots, his children. Uh, we think about Macbeth 4-2 and, and the young boy of Macduff and, and his comments. Here we'll have the fool, and the fool will say it out loud to, to Lear. It is true I'm a fool, but I'm not as much of a fool as you. I'd rather be the fool I am than the fool that you are. And he can get away with this, and of course the audience realizes that in fact this fool is not just providing stand-up comedy, he's providing in fact a profound insight to the stupidity of, of, uh, of Lear. And then um, Caius, who is, the, uh, who is actually Kent in disguise, will also be with Lear. And then he's got these knights, a hundred of them in his retinue, and they are kind of, uh, they're kind of loud and braggadocious, and they fawn all over Lear and all of that. Well, Goneril is having none of this, right? Very quickly, she's fed up with the whole project, and she's ready to boot them all out and, and to tell her father, there is no way you're going to have this many men sitting in my house. And the process of lessening his retinue is a clearly visible way of the fall of Lear. He's no longer going to be this regal king that he once was. Um, she will say it. I, 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 I don't run a tavern or a brothel here. I have a, I have a, 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 a kingdom, and, and I'm going to run it the right way. Of course, what really is Goneril's fear is that he wants, you know, he wants to recant on what it is that he's done. And given his knights, he could easily do this. In other words, he could always just change his mind. It's clear that Lear will change his mind in the drop of a pin, back to our original observations. And so Goneril has some self-preservation. She's got to continue, right? Lear gets upset. And he says, you know, a, a, a pox on your house, and he leaves and goes to Regan uh, to expect better treatment at the hands of Regan. Ouch. Well, in the process, um, um, back and forth, this complaining project starts to happen. And between the two of them, mm, it's almost like we're back to Ulysses between Scylla and Charybdis. We're definitely between two monsters here. Of course, Regan's not going to have any, any of uh, Lear's pouting, his, his, um, his um, complaining, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and between the two of them, they ultimately then will um, take the number down, 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 until finally Lear's got virtually no knights at all. He's given up his power, and therefore he's given up his authority, and therefore he has to learn to live without that. It's at this point that, of course, Lear starts to realize that maybe he made a monumental mistake. This is what we call, of course, dramatic on stage irony. It takes Lear, like it takes Oedipus, a while to figure it out. Of course, the audience has known all along this is not going to work. At the very beginning of the play, Cordelia steps up into the faces of uh, Regan and Goneril to make sure the audience knows. She begs them to take good care of her father. She knows full well that they won't. And to that degree, again, we have to ask the question, why in heaven's name would Cordelia let Regan and Goneril win simply by not wanting to flatter her father in a moment in which he clearly is being immature? Well, of course, this leads ultimately to Lear going out into the storm. This is a pivotal moment in our play. Out into the woods, out into the storm, and Lear ostensibly loses his mind. Now, we have said before that Shakespeare is very interested in issues of madness and how one loses one's mind. And clearly, we will see this game getting played here. All kinds of interesting things happen out in the woods. We're going to have some amazing soliloquies. I can't get into all this, but fascinating stuff going on. Ultimately, Lear's going to end up in a little hovel where he's going to play a um, kind of like a fake trial scene where he's going to put his two daughters on trial and he talks to stools as if they are the two daughters. It's a pretty tragic, it's a pretty tragic moment. Here we are in the thunderstorm. Lear runs into poor Tom, which is of course Edgar, disguised, right? He's near naked, he's mad, he's pretending to be mad. 
And um, uh, the, the reality is that the exchanges then between Edgar and Lear show them to be both the victims of circumstance. Some of their own contrivance and their own naivete, no doubts, their own stupidity. Some of these beyond their control. I mean, Edgar clearly doesn't realize until it's too late that Edmund has not been someone he can trust. Obviously, Lear thought he could trust his daughters, right? In this moment, as well, Shakespeare is pointing out what we have said in our study of Hamlet and elsewhere, the democratization that Shakespeare is always playing with, taking that nobleman pyramid, that idea of, of, the, of the nobleness of society, and collapsing it down. For example, in the, in the third act, in the fourth scene, um, you've got this interesting line, man is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal. Um, Lear will consider. That is to say, we all end up, no matter whether we're king or we're fool, all end up somehow buffeted by the terrible forces of nature. It's at this point that Lear begins to with, re re remove clothes. He starts to uh, look in increasingly like he's mad, right? Meanwhile, see, we got this subplot thing going on. Meanwhile, we got Gloucester, right? Um, he decides to help Lear and um, the, he goes against Regan and Goneril, right, and their commands. And he will give Lear and the posse that is a part of it, uh, part of Lear, some shelter, a little hovel, and, um, and, and we're just outside of Gloucester's palace. Um, he says that they should all go to Dover and join Cordelia, who is there with uh, the, the French troops and, of course, her French husband. Um, they're obviously going to try to come back. Maybe the sense here is to restore Lear back to his rightful place on the throne, maybe to uh, you know, run, run the country. Uh, but it's clear that Cordelia still loves her father and wants to help him. Gloucester comes back to the palace. He's caught. He's accused of being a traitor. We have another kind of um, kangaroo-like court uh, where Gloucester is found guilty, and then in the most disturbing scene in maybe all of Shakespeare, the eyes of, Gloucester, of 